Uh, I'm very, very excited um, for, you know, a number of reasons, one of them being that basically what I'm going to uh, talk about here is my dissertation. And secondly, that creating this presentation for today, um, my, dissert, yeah, my dissertation, uh, creating this, the, this presentation allowed me to kind of uh, put some things together and everything fell into place so smoothly. Uh, so that was the, the final touch that I, uh, that I really needed. And so this is, this is extremely, extremely exciting. And um, I will now share the screen so bear with me because that's you know uh you never know how that goes um that should be hopefully this and you show hopefully should be seeing the presentation on a full yeah. screen is that what's happening Do you no, see? see we see the speaker notes so presenters okay. mode that's not good we need the, the, we need the other screen we see this uh, yeah okay Okay. Uh, let's try another uh, uh, monitor. And sometimes uh, this this option, uh, I can't explain it in Polish, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, okay. Well, I just uh, this, bear with me. How do I? I just the... uh, maybe just close the presentation, and then um, uh, just press escape or, or something. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then uh, stop the screen sharing. Okay. And now. Uh, uh, start the presentation. Oh, okay. And that then, when when starting the screen sharing, just uh, pick the pick the uh, the right screen where. Okay. The, the okay. 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 I'm so sorry for this, no, no, uh, okay. but you know how you know. <laughs> uh, okay, sharing the screen, and are you seeing the presentation now? Yes. yes. <laughs> Yay! Okay, <laughs> fantastic. And um, okay. Thank you, thank you for, for the patience. Um, all right, so um, like as, as, as you all know, this is um, playing with identities in meta-referential video games. Um, basically, I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. This is the, probably the most important thing here. Uh, what I will be talking, um, can you maybe, wow. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> uh, what I am going to be talking uh, today about is, um, well, basically, metareferentiality and metafiction. Uh, so I want to start by, well, explaining kind of what, the term, what these terms mean and how do they differ from each other. Since both of them come from um, postmodernism, uh, that means that the number of possible definitions is endless because this is probably the most defining trait of postmodernism that no one can agree what exactly which thing means exactly including postmodernism uh, so i will be talking about about um, a little bit you know very briefly what uh, how do i use these terms and what do they mean for to me uh, and how do they apply to to video games and then kind of move into more um, detailed discussion of specific um, devices formal devices that are being used to um, uh, to talk about identities and how it is how it is being uh, used. Okay, I'm gonna have to. Okay, uh, so very briefly, metafiction as um, a term that has been coined by William Glass and has been developed by Robert Scholz in 1970, and this is probably the least in interesting thing about it right now. Uh, in the simplest way to talk about it, uh, metafiction denotes fiction about fiction. And it refers to a number of um, uh, texts in different media that can be described as self-reflective, self-informing, self-reflexive, narcissistic even, as Hutchin would have it. Uh, but it basically all boils to the fact that uh, this is a type of fiction that rather than pretending that there is no mediation happening and there is no difference in what medium is used, it's drawing the attention of the reader, of the audience, of the, of the player, to the medium and to the materiality of that um, of the text, as you will see later, it can mean that uh, we have, for example, some games, many mainstream games, that try creating the realistic, unmediated effect. Uh, which also, interestingly, usually when the, uh, we say here unmediated effect or realistic effect, it means kind of like film-like rather than real life-like. But that's a completely different um, uh, topic here. Uh, and metafiction, in metafiction, what would happen is to have those, um, uh, it happens in games for, 
because we're talking about games, that will, instead of trying to pretend that there is no computer, no PlayStation, no controller, no, no screen, no anything, and you're immersed fully in the, in the story, it rather shows that, well, there, there are all those things, and these things are very, very important. So it can draw attention to, um, to the software that it's used, to the hardware that is being used, or on the more diegetic level, um, there is a narrator that's telling the story. These are fictional characters and so on. So metafiction will be the, the genre that's, um, that's pointing out to, uh, to, to, to the fiction and it's not, uh, and it's not trying to hide it. Uh, Metareferentiality, on the other hand, uh, I am using this term after Vernon Wolf for, uh, from his 2008 book, Metareference Acrospedia, which I also very recommend, um, which basically refers to the very similar thing where metafiction would be more of a genre, metareferentiality would be a maybe quality of a, of a text. Uh, and it's, it just refers to, to exactly once again to this, to, um, to the text that draws attention to its materiality, its structure, references, context of its creation. Uh, and metareference for Wolf was a type of, um, type of reference uh, that requires the prior knowledge of the text that came, for example, before it. Um, that is a very important part from both metareferentiality and metafiction, uh, because it really requires to, to, to interpret it in a context. Like text is not in a vacuum, it's not just the text and nothing else ever happened, but this is the, the, the text um, that happened, you know, in a, the, to, to fully appreciate it. We need to know the context. Think about it that way. If you play a game that um, has a princess that is, uh, um, that has to find her girlfriend and uh, who is another princess, for example, uh, who has been kidnapped by somebody and for the game, she is chasing that other princess that keeps being moved to the other castle. You will immediately know that this is a subversion of a theme from uh, Mario games, right? So then you play Meat Boy, you play a Bright and whatever else, and you understand that this is, this is a reference to the other text. This it might be a type of uh, metareferentiality. Uh, also on the, on the more, um, of all the references that are referencing other texts, other media, sometimes not just the games and so on. Okay. Um, in, when we are talking about um, games and especially independent games, because I'm gonna be talking about especially independent games here, uh, there is a very, very large number of formal techniques that can be used to, to achieve this effect, right? To have to draw the attention of the of the player again to the fact that it's fiction, that it's media, that it's being played on something specific, and that it came in a long um, from the from the is embedded in a long tradition of other of other texts. Some of these um, that are um, noted here are under the, the the red ones. I'm going to be talking uh, more about uh, in a moment. So hypermediacy and fragmentation, but some others will can include uh, unreliable narrator, of course. And um, that uh, would be a narrator that, because with a narrator, we have the um, expectation that they will tell the story how it is, and we listen to it and we believe that, and that's great. With unreliable narrator, that's of course a narrator that cannot be trusted because they are not being truthful for whatever reason. Uh, with games, I, uh, because I did a little bit, that's again, one of my chapters. Uh, so one of these, um, uh, the, with the narrator, unreliable narrator, um, one of the inf interesting questions to ask is why, why are they being unreliable? Uh, it can be because they have a hidden agenda and they are trying to trick the player to do something or, or maybe um, uh, to, to, for them to obtain a certain ending or something like this. Or they might be um, what I'm going to be calling compulsive liar, and the screenshot from tells from the, the Borderlands. Uh, it's not, um, you know, uh, by accident here because uh, some of you will probably know. Uh, uh, tells from the Borderlands, the game in which you control both two characters, Riz and Fiona, and both of them are telling the story, the same story, but from their two different uh, points of view, which are often very, very contradictory. Which may, means that the player has to play from both through both. Um, stories not being able to trust either of them because they are both um, not not truthful and they are as Riz is saying on the on the screenshot here he's usually not lying he's just embellishing so this is not because he wants to trick the player he just wants to he's just telling the story this is how he does it another um, very interesting use of um, 
of a reliable narrator can be uh, in a situations where the narrator's untruthfulness is not because they are trying to trick us, but because they are in some kind of altered mental state. Uh, might be they are hallucinating. Might be that they have um, some mental, uh, some, some, some. Uh, there, there's an illness, or they might be depressed, and everything is distorted to dark and, and black and white. Or like in Senua's sacrifice, and when she's hearing voices, uh, the players hearing them as well. Uh, but uh, that is not so the, un the unreliability is because the narrator is portraying the world how they are seeing it but this is not how the world possibly really is uh, in Senua's case um, that's uh, that's a very interesting one with showing how psychosis um, sounds like and uh, it kind of breaches the gap between the player and the and the character but allowing them to to experience the the, the, the completely different identity of a person um, Hypermediacy and fragmentation, like I said, I will be talking about uh, some more in a moment. And uh, glitch aesthetics, um, definitely something that happens very, very often. Uh, and I'm talking here about glitch aesthetics rather than just glitch. So not the glitch that happens because there is an actual error in the, in the, mm, something went wrong and, and code just went places and there is a glitch, but rather glitch alikes. So glitch aesthetics, when the game is purposefully made to look like if something bad is happening with the visuals of the or the, or the rules and so on. And this is something that happens in many other games that I will be talking about uh, as a way of signaling that something is off, that the player should be maybe think more, more curious, more, more alert about what is happening. Um, but it's also something that uh, mainstream games, of course, really like with Batman Asylum, for example, when um, the moment when Batman is losing his, um, he's starting to see things differently than they are. Everything is also glitching for that for the player, and that's also a very interesting thing that I will come back to in a moment. Um, and of course, breaking the fourth wall, which I will not be talking a lot because it's one of, one one of my favorite topics. And if I start, I will never stop. So that's that's that. Very important thing to kind of um, ask uh, ourselves and something that I will be coming back to throughout this presentation is what is the purpose of these devices, of these experiments? Is it to immerse the player or is it to uh, create the state of the familiarization? With um, many, often the intuition would be that it's the second, uh, that um, uh, citing here um, Brecht, who was writing about that in theatrical context, he would say that um, when we reveal the materiality of the play, or in this case of, of, of a game, uh, that is supposedly taking the, the audience out of the immersion in order to facilitate more critical um, engagement with the text. So all of that, what I just was talking about, or which, which I just talked about, would be um, done in order to make the player more critically engaged with the text to maybe understand more to maybe and so on and uh, according to some it's definitely the opposite of immersion because if we can see that this is a um this is a, a computer game or video game or however else we mobile game so on uh how can we be very much immersed but what i want to show here is that it's not always that um obvious or as, as you know as clear okay and one more thing before moving to, to more um, detailed um, uh, discussion of examples is that this is I already said that but to, to emphasize that this is something that happens much more often with independent games sometimes with the mainstream games sometimes with independent uh, more often with independent which uh, well probably most of all, probably for obvious reasons of there being more uh, creative freedom and for them, uh, for the creators to be able to experiment and push the boundaries of the of the genre and of the medium a little further. The examples here, uh, very quickly, uh, Stanley Parable, um, which of course uh, very much influenced how unreliable narration is being done in, in games and a lot of, and kind of encouraged many of the games that um, that are meta-referential or metafictional seem to, um, well, seem to definitely have been inspired by, by Stanley Parable. And the less known example, which I already used on the, on the main slide, comes from Glitched, which is still in its demo version, 
sadly. I'm really waiting for the full release for many years now. Um, it's a game about which basically relies on the relationship between the player and the, and the character that they control, in this case, Gus, that you, whom you can see on the slide, um, who basically uh, through the entirety of the adventure uh, Gas uh, talks to the player and player talks to, to Gas. Um, as you can see here, it's from my own playthrough where I can either introduce myself by my name or uh, break it to them, the, the, to Gas, that uh, I am the player and he's in a video game, although that causes existential crisis and there are many problems uh, related to that. Um, okay, so let's talk about fragmentation a little bit. Fragmentation in terms of postmodern fiction or metafiction meta in in general, is a very, very interesting and very complex um, and very important uh, kind of area uh, because fragmentation can relate to so many different things. In video games, we can talk about fragmentation in terms of non-linear non narrat nar narrative, for example, or um, of um, time, of how, for example, some casual games or mobile games allow for that fragmented um, playthrough play and Shira Chess wrote about it very interestingly in uh, Ready Player Two about how uh, women especially started to play more with on um, mob mob mobile games because they allowed for this short um, play moments of playing in between of other activities. Um, but what I want to concentrate on here the most right now, it's uh, mini games. And to quote, uh, to, to provide a, you know, a definition, mini games are simple activities contained within a larger game and they're common in commercial titles. They are generally short, self-contained play experiences within a larger game frame framework, but with their own internal logic, game, st game state and mechanics. And um, probably intuitively when I say uh, mini games, you all have a, already an vision of what that means and that's a kind of um, seems like a very um, intuitive um, word phrase concept um, and of course mini games can be very various and very different uh, in general we're talking here about short shorter nested games so game in a game um, which can be either like for example here are uh, three examples on the bottom uh, of the screen. Uh, they can be very much literally inserted into the main playthrough um, gameplay. Uh, for example, Assassin's Creed and all of other Assassin's Creeds and Lockpicking, which is one of the most famous and most used examples if you are talking about mini games, because it's, um, it's kind of a game in a game. It has its own um, goal it has its own rules its own um you you can win it you can lose it and it's kind of you know embedded into the main uh, narrative uh on the right i have an example from dream daddy that 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 dating simulator uh which is a visual novel in which you are a dad and you're dating other dads and uh, very interestingly in each playthrough so in which um trying to date each dad, there is also one or a few more mini games in that, which completely change the gameplay. So that's already, um, you know, each are kind of um, toned to and kind of tailored to what kind of personality this dad has or what activity this dad, um, this particular father has, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, what's, what's their thing. Uh, but it's also something that needs to be done. It has, you can win it. Uh, but in order to win the bigger plot line of this of dating this particular um, dad, you need to finish the mini game. So these are more like a, mini games that are inserted into the a larger narrative. And the example from Fall Guys, very recently um, released um, online party multiplayer game. Uh, it's a game that's um, it's basically made out of mini games. Every layer, every level can be uh, interpreted as as a mini game. So this is also something that happens in all the uh, Mario Party games and games, um, you know, of that of that type. And um, and this is this is the 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 the, ver the, hmm, the type of mini games. Um, so a game made out of mini games that I want to talk about here very briefly, um, because this type of fragmentation seems to be very well. Um, suited to talking about microaggressions. And because of that kind of drawing the attention of the players to the um, identities and the, and the experiences of people whose experiences might not be familiar to them. 
So that was done by um, Anna Tropy in, uh, in Dysphoria that some of you are familiar with. It was done in Consume Me, which is unfortunately still in the demo version. I don't know if it will ever come out, but I'm talking about it because there's so far a few games that, um, that feature eating disorders. And uh, in Sweet X Heart about racism and microaggressions. And can I come back? Yeah. And all of these, all of these use the fragmentation as their main gameplay, really. So the main gameplay are these tiny games that usually are overlooked or are not something that is the main part of it, exactly to draw attention to the um, to how small and maybe for someone else insignificant, but very significant to the person in question. Um, occurrences are shaping the experience. In case of, of um, Dysphoria and some other games that were released around that time, uh, portraying the, um, the experience of, um, of hormonal therapy and basically trans experience, uh, concentrating on both the, the physical feelings. So again, the like mini game based around the fact that um, her uh, nipples are incredibly sens sensitive and um, how to avoid the, the little stimuli. And uh, and for example, that everything my girlfriend says makes me cry, and the mouth and the shield, and how you have to you have to um, go through it with um, everything changing towards the end as the as the therapy goes through. Uh, similarly, in in consume me, a lot of attention is placed on the um, how those again small and seemingly insignificant moments are shaping the great the greater uh, narrative through, for example. Um, mostly, mostly focusing not just on the the eating part of the eating disorders, but on the um, compulsive thoughts that that come with it. So the thoughts that come with uh, uh, the difficulty of getting up and and um, you know eating and trying to fit the the, the right um, amounts of food and so on. And in in here in this case. Uh, racism and microaggressions and like every day that with uh, again moments of every day uh so once again is it immersion or is it the familiarization in one way it's the familiarization because the, definitely because it takes out um a person from a player from a, a more um, linear or fluid uh experience of play and takes them out and every time forces to consider new mechanics and every, and the change is constant. So when the change is constant, we cannot get habituated and just accept, okay, this is how the game looks. Uh, but on the other hand, that really bridges the gap between what is happening to the player and to the, to the character, who's uh, very much likely not from um, uh, maybe the, the, the player. These are the, these are the experiences of people um, who are, um, who belong to minorities, right? So the idea is that the player might not belong to the same minority uh, or the, op well, that's always minority or to the same oppressed group in some way. Um, and one more thing that I want to squeeze in is hypermediacy, like I promised, uh, which is, again, you'll find a lot of similarities with what I just said about metareferentiality uh, because it em emphasizes the presence of interfaces and the software drawing attention to the mediated character of the text. Once again, rather than pretending that um, definitely we're playing the game, but there is no UI and the wind is letting us go and telling us where to go, which I believe it's uh, uh, Ghost of Tsukushima's uh, case, uh, rather to just to just embrace it and show it and, and not try to hide it. Uh, and I want to focus here, especially on desktop simulators, simulators or interface games. So games in which, and I'm quoting here after Gallagher, players are afforded a user's eye view of digital devices housing intimate personal data. Uh, so you will be familiar with the concept and the concept itself is not very, uh, very surprising. So these are the games in which the entirety of the gameplay is happening either on the computer screen or on the um, mobile phone screen. Um, usually in a very interesting way, completely bridging the gap between who the player is and who, basically that's the entire idea of the fourth wall, right? Uh, for example, in a normal lost phone, uh, the player is, um, the player is a person who found a phone and is trying to decipher the identity of the person who lost the phone. 
Uh, so there is, in a way, the, the fourth rule is abolished, right? The, the player is the person who's plays, who's the player is playing the person who's picking up the phone. So there is no difference between that person and the player. And uh, quite similarly, my second, um, I'm going to describe it in a moment, is bury, bury me, my love, in which um, the situation is a little different because it's, again, happening entirety, uh, in its entirety on the mobile phone screen, but the um, uh, player is uh, playing the role of, um, uh, of a husband of Nur who uh, is, is um, trying to get from Syria to, um, to Europe because you know, of war. And um, I'm using these two next to each other because of a little small differences between them. But also because, uh, well, as much as norm a normal lost phone was trying and um, to show the perspective of a transgender person running away from home because of transphobia that they are experiencing, um, it's problematic. It's po no, unfortunately it does succeed completely because of hmm. um, of using the experience to of a of an um, oppressed person of a transgender person uh, as kind of an, an anecdote that and to to for, for the player because the player goes through the messages um deciphers the identity and can the the gameplay is very limited there. it's limited to to finding the solutions inside of the phone how to open something how to find a password and so on which is already a little problematic and go through the for the for the messages sometimes with an ability to send an unsent message or to send a photo of the person of the protagonist um on a lovebirds dating app to somebody so that's revealing how they are how they are looking which you know bridges on the um, again, on the on the judgment towards how how a trans person should look like, and so on and so on. Um, but what is and definitely in this this regard, very my love does it much in a much better way. Um, with uh, where where a normal lost phone has, like I mentioned, few screens. So there is this main screen of the of um, with all the apps on it. So the bury me my love basically has only the messenger open with ability to check a map where not is and so on but uh, the gameplay which is very very limited in both situations um is limited to either looking at the story of the discussion as it progresses or to choosing an answer which can be one of the emojis on one of the uh, two answers that are very uh, of course limited um but what again because immersion or the familiarization uh, in one way player is extremely constrained in both situations right the, the gameplay is very very limited so they are not um they are not uh there's the the, the cho where's the choice where's the where's the agency and so on um so which already takes the player a little bit you know out of the game experience um but on the other hand uh by using the very familiar to us, um, you know, phone screen, especially when you play it on the phone, that's then there's just you just feel like you're getting the messages, which is especially um, interesting in the case of Bury Me My Love, which has the option. And speaking of fragmentation, once again, it has the option of um, either playing the story in one sitting or getting the messages as neuro progresses in the story, which means that basically the messages are coming as at different times of the day and um, really that really feels bridges again bridges the gap between me the player and the characters in the story and um, because it's just you know i am a user of a smart band so sometimes i'm somewhere and i'm getting a message that you get a new message nor is writing to you and probably is writing to me because I got stopped on one border somewhere i got really invested in that i am very very worried you know what's what's happening there uh, but that's that's a very very interesting way of um, doing that because well, on one hand you can argue of course that the choice here is because well objectively it's easier to to, to design and program a game which has text based basically game that, that just appears as a as a text message than you know a realistic Witcher style um, adventure but on the other hand because of the familiarity of the of of the um, 
of the interface and and the way that that this uh, story is being presented uh, in the short you know short messages happening here here and there and something like this definitely has a uh, um, ability to draw people in players in um and and also again kind of brings closer the character to the player um making this emotional connection so introduces the identities of of um showcases people and and talks about identities in a way that's maybe not possible uh in the situation when there's full immersion um like that so uh, that's actually yeah that and then it goes for almost all of the of the devices that i was talking about um because of the way that um on one way you're taken out of the of the um, of the immersion but on the other maybe the emotional bond is created a little stronger between you and the and the player and that was something that was pointed out to me very recently that it's actually not only interesting but uh brecht might not have agreed as much um, so yeah, so uh, basically coming up to, to a conclusion here, um, it's many independent games, they are experimenting with this, not as many as one would think, maybe, um, and definitely there was a boom for um, experimental metafictional games between 2010 and 2017 for some reason, that was what was when they are the, the most, so many of them, uh, but some, you know, still happening and still being used as a device to to talk about experiences of people who are um, who are marginalized or who are oppressed who who's who are not you know white cis heterosexual middle-aged men basically um and uh that's that's really interesting that the metafiction can be then it can be uh argued that it's uniquely suited to tackle identities and often it does not uh, because it's not exactly when you think about it from the postmodern point of view which of course was playing a little bit with uh with well identities were a very and fluid identities were a very important part of it but um but a lot of that was kind of an art for the art sake or experiments for the sake of experiments and um, and it's interesting how independent games are taking that formula and taking these devices uh, to 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 do something more with them and show maybe those um, the ways that these identities are just being used you know without um, in such a simple uh, and yet sometimes fragmented way and that's my bibliography I have more if somebody wants that and that would be all of uh, that I wanted to talk to you about right now. And I will try to stop sharing. That's not how you do it. And stop sharing. Haha. -ha. Okay. Yay. <laughs>